Janet Baker is our guest today, and she shares a fascinating story of a more than century old injustice known as the Brownsville Affair or the Brownsville Incident of 1906. Janet's father, William Baker, investigated the Brownsville Incident as Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army and wrote a book about it after he retired. The Brownsville, Texas Incident of 1906, the true and tragic story of a Black battalion's wrongful disgrace and ultimate redemption. It's available through Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble, and other fine booksellers. Janet Baker, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Thanks so much, Chris. You have so many inspiring guests on your show. It's a great honor to be invited to share my father's book. Brownsville was my father's passion, a book he researched and wrote for over 30 years. No, that's terrific. And we're going to get right into that. And, you know, maybe you could just take a few minutes before we start there to share your story with us. Where were you educated? Where do you live? And what do you do? Okay, sure. Chris, I am a recovering lawyer. I actually practice law as a general counsel at S&P Global. I negotiate and advise on international business transactions and data protection matters impacting the company's products and services. In terms of my education, I graduated from the University of Virginia School of Law and earned an MPA from the Maxwell School at Syracuse. I earned my bachelor's degree at Williams College and spent my junior abroad at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. You know, I apparently didn't do my homework as well as I thought, because uh, as my listeners know, and we'll talk about it here later about your father, but Syracuse is my beloved alma mater, both undergrad and graduate school and MPA as well. So uh, birds of a feather here. So we got connected for a reason. I didn't know that. Wow. And you know, my father has an MBA from Syracuse. So all yep. three of us are connected, Chris. Yep. Go orange. That makes up for your recovering law degree from UVA with the other orange school in the ACC, but we won't talk about that. Okay. <laughs> so as I, as I mentioned, the Brownsville incident of 1906 is a riveting story of racial discrimination and justice delayed. The 167 black men who were involved lost their careers, their salaries, their pensions, and their military honors. It was a decades long injustice that thanks to Jan's dad, Bill Baker, included new chapters with revisions and corrections and a new ending even if it can never be fully righted. Janet, your dad was born in 1931, 25 years after the Brownsville incident. He investigated it many years later, but he developed a very profound connection to it when he was just a child. That connection is revealed in the first pages of his book. Would you be so kind as to read the opening pages of his book for us, please? Sure, Chris. I'll start with chapter one in the book, and it's called Stranger at the Door. And keep in mind, it's from the point of view of my father as a five-year-old child. Southwest Georgia, 1936. One day late in the evening in the heart of the Great Depression, I sat on the front steps and watched a stranger walking down the dirt road to my grandpa's house. The old man walked with an air of dignity. His step suggested he'd been a soldier, coming with a deliberate, rhythmic, and precise cadence. As he walked, his shoes kicked up little clouds of red dust, which rose to the top of his boots. His clothes were clean, but old and tattered, and dotted with holes that had been patched many times. He wore a quaint, funny-looking hat, one that I had never seen before. I scampered up the steps, ran into the house, and told Grandma Angeline that a beggar was coming. She took a whole cake of bread from the cupboard, wrapped it in a newspaper, and went to the door. As she was coming through the door with the bread, the man was mounting the steps. I was hanging on to Grandma's apron. Reaching into his pocket, he pulled out some pennies and offered to pay. Angeline walked to the edge of the porch with the bread and told him she wouldn't take anything for it, but the stranger insisted, telling Angeline that he was not a beggar. She told him to take the bread and may the good Lord be with him. He accepted the bread gracefully, turned and left. The next day I was standing beside Grandma Angeline at the corner of the country general store. We were waiting to gra for grandpa to return from the Gulf of Mexico with oysters. It was not yet dark, but evening shadows were beginning to fall. We expected to see him combing over the hill at any time. Then suddenly I heard the sound of a car skidding on the road, brakes squealing as it tried to stop. The smell of the burning rubber permeated the air. A cloud of red dust trailed the skidding car. I saw an old man trying to cross the road. Someone had shouted at him, watch out, watch out, car, car. Too late. It was a dull thud, a cry of pain. The car dragged the man several feet, then sped away. I turned away from the noise and buried my face in my grandma's apron. A cloud of red dust mixed with the leaves swept by, 
caught in the wind from the speeding car. The dust covered my shoes and clung to my pants. The people were running across the street, forming a crowd around the still figure still lying in the street. Grandma held onto me tightly, but I broke free and I ran across the street. I picked up the old man's hat. Then I rushed into the crowd, working my way through the people to the interior of the circle. I looked at the old man lying motionless on the ground, face up, eyes wide open. People stood around talking, shaking their head, certain the man was dead. Their voices were low, hushed and respectful. No one tried to help. I recognized the man as a stranger who'd come to grandpa's door. My grandfather came through the crowd and knelt beside the man. He lifted the stranger's hand, felt his wrist and then looked off in the distance. I approached grandpa slowly and handed him the hat. Grandpa placed the hat over the dead man's face. Then he told me that he knew the old man from a long, long time ago. He was one of the soldiers from Brownsville. So that's how your father learned about the Brownsville incident from his grandfather, who was a former slave. That certainly must have made a searing impression on a young child. Oh, absolutely, Chris. When the stranger came to my father's door and his grandfather's story made an indelible impression that my father never forgets. My dad's grandfather, Ned Keaton, was born into slavery in 1862 at the end of the Civil War, and he was a great storyteller. He heard the Brownsville story and passed it along to my father when he was a boy. He told him how President Theodore Roosevelt had misjudged and mistreated a regiment of black soldiers. President Roosevelt accused the soldiers of getting drunk, breaking out of their army camp and shooting wildly into people's homes. Dad's grandfather didn't believe the black soldiers participated in the shooting. He said Roosevelt deceived the men, disgraced the colored race and betrayed his brothers in arms. Roosevelt, then a colonel had fought side by side with these very men in the Spanish American War of 1898 in Cuba and the Philippines. So I think this story is as much about your father as it is about a terrible moment in America's history in 1906. Unlike many blacks of his era and many in later years who were denied access to education, your grandparents were able to see to it that your father received a formal education. He was a valedictorian of his high school class. You know, I've read about his remarkable educational accomplishments. We mentioned his MBA at Syracuse, but I think you should do the honors of sharing that part of his life with our audience, please. Sure. This is an interesting piece of my father's life, Chris, that he shared with his family. Having graduated from Adipogas Vocational High School in their college prep program, he was awarded a full scholarship to Tuskegee Institute, but he only remained there for two weeks. He determined that this was not the challenging economic, challenging academic education he'd envisioned for himself, anyone whom. He wrote to Fisk University, Harvard University, and Howard University. Fisk had no openings. Harvard said he qualified, but they had their quota of Negroes. Howard University, I'm sorry, Harvard said that. And then Howard University president, Dr. Mordecai Johnson told him that they'd be happy to have him and offered him a full scholarship. So then after earning his MBA at Syracuse in 1964, he joined the army. Why do you make that unusual choice? This was actually an error in the article. It wasn't, it was the army that actually sent my father to Syracuse to obtain his MBA. They actually did this for many officers and they continue to provide advanced degrees to officers in business medicine and other areas as needed by the Department of Defense. Your father served in Vietnam, earned two bronze stars and other medals for his service there. Did he ever talk to you about his time in Vietnam? And if so, what experiences did he share? No, he did not discuss Vietnam per se. I mean, he did talk about the monkey jungle where large numbers of these primates inhabited the area. Uh, he was secretary to the general staff in Vietnam and had to report the number of casualties each day. Vietnam was rarely discussed in our house because of the political angst surrounding it nationally. So now that takes us to the early 1970s and what by then was a largely forgotten piece of history. Your father was signed to the newly formed Office of Equal Opportunity at the Pentagon in 1972. Augustus Hawkins of California was the first black person elected to Congress west of the Mississippi. He was elected in 1962, thanks in part to the endorsement of John F. Kennedy. Hawkins took a special interest in the Brownsville incident. He had concluded the 167 black soldiers were innocent, that they'd been wrongly discharged. Could you pick up the story for there for us? 
Sure. My father had just returned from an assignment in Europe for the White House when his boss, Colonel Brooks, asked him to bring the Brownsville papers into his office. It's here where his memory recalls that old man's death on that dusty country road as a child, and my father's odyssey begins. After reviewing the task at hand, he volunteers to write what's called a non-concurrence, which means he disagreed with a judge, advocate general, or JAG's opposition to this Hawkins bill. When an officer writes a non-concurrence and disagreement to an army action, it sets up a highly contentious matter. Not to spoil reading the book, but this is where Hawkins' bill becomes an issue. The Secretary of the Army, Melvin Laird, is asked to rectify the injustice of Brownsville. The, st the staff judge advocate did not concur with the Hawkins' bill. To do so would have meant opposing the decision and the legacy of a powerful president, President Theodore Roosevelt. My, set, my dad sets about to do this research to find out what really happened on that fateful night of August 13th, 1906. He learns the town of Brownsville is seized by anger, fear, and fraught with racism and dislike for the black soldiers of the 25th Infantry who've been sent to replace the all white unit that was leaving. So what is the Brownsville incident? So when the black soldiers arrive in Brownsville on July 26, 1906, they're met with gross hostility and mistreatment by the white citizens and authorities. They're even accused of knocking a white woman to the ground. On August 13th at midnight, the town is viciously attacked by a group of about 25 unidentified bandits who shoot up the town, leaving a white, lieutenant, a white police lieutenant wounded and a white bartender and a horse dead. Two unidentified black soldiers stationed nearby at Fort Brown are accused by the city's mayor. The following day, the headline in the local paper read, dastardly outrage by Negro soldiers. The soldiers were members of a, a segregated battalion. They proclaimed their innocence. Their white commander said they believed they were all innocent and in their barracks at the time of the crime, but it didn't appear that their rifles, and it didn't appear that their rifles had actually been fired. But white citizens said they'd seen black soldiers on the street shooting up the town and handed over spent shells from the army rifles to, su to support their version of the events. Six investigations by the government failed to prove which soldiers, if any, shot up the town. Despite evidence that the shells had been planted, investigators accepted white citizens' accounts. So too to President Theodore Roosevelt, who discharged all 167 members of the unit, even those who were in the hospital and away from Brownsville in Mexico at the time of the incident. Roosevelt discharged them without honor, without due process, and without trial, saying they'd engage in a conspiracy of silence by refusing to confess or incriminate their fellow soldiers. Two years later, a Senate inquiry upheld this action. It was the only incidence of mass punishment in the history of the regular US Army. The men, in fact, were innocent of any wrongdoing, yet they had to live the rest of their lives in shame, Chris. As my dad began to study and review the evidence, he grew to mistrust much of it, and as a result, delved deeply into the six investigations, all, conduct, all concluded the guilt of the soldiers. However, within these thousands of pages was the evidence that actually proved the soldiers were innocent, which was determined by two major findings. One was a Wiegenstein and the Leckie experiments. Another was a microscopic ordnance investigation by the Springfield Armory in Massachusetts. Wiegenstein discredited the 14 eyewitnesses testimony. He did this by examining the accuracy of the night vision. He determined that the white people could not have seen what they claimed to have seen on that dark cloudy night of August 13th. Leckie proved the shots could not have been fired from Company B barracks from Fort Brown because the location of the bullet would have had to have made a 90 degree angle turn in the middle of the air to hit the various houses. Leckie also examined a bullet embedded in the post outside the Ruby Saloon that was shot that evening. He determined that it was not a bullet from the Black Soldier Springfield 03 rifle, but from a different gun, a 45. The third piece of critical evidence that my dad called the smoking bullet was from the investigative report by the Springfield, Massachusetts Armory. The Armory examined the shells that were scattered in Calvin Alley after the shooting and determined that those shells had not been shot in Brownsville at all, Chris. They were actually shot at the troops' prior location in Fort Nyaroba, Nebraska. Somebody collected those old shells, which were setting in a box outside on the steps at Fort Brown and planted them in the town of Brownsville. It was this powerful information that contained in the reports, but ignored 
that finally gave my father the evidence he needed to exonerate those falsely accused men and give them the justice that had eluded them for almost seven decades. The most poignant moment for my dad is when he learns from famous World War II General Mark Clark that there is a survivor and his name is Dorsey Willis, a man well into his 80s. General Clark is calling on behalf of Mr. J.C. Cornelius, a wealthy banker from Minnesota who knows Mr. Willis. Mr. Willis shined shoes in, this, in his bank and told his story to Mr. J.C. Cornelius. They're personal friends. The army doctors examined Mr. Willis based on his early medical records from the military and determined that he's a legitimate survivor. Now we know where we get your interest in law from, given all the research your father did. So, you know, we mentioned your dad wasn't a historian, but he took a very, very methodical, meticulous historian approach to the project, didn't he? Uh, yes, he did. He was very meticulous. He was very meticulous. And even then, given all the research he did, there was resistance to reverse the original inquiry. Why do you think uh, that was? Uh, yes, there was great resistance. I think anytime you go against a power structure, power structure, particularly when race is involved, there's denial and resistance. But Americans show us every day that there will always be people who speak truth to power and those who are open to the message of redemptive justice. That's what happened in Brownsville with my dad's supporters at the Pentagon, particularly Lieutenant General Bernie Rogers. He was in charge of personnel, Major General DeWitt Smith Jr. of Army Public Affairs. They accompanied dad to award Mr. Willis an apology from the US Army, the American flag and a $25,000 check for compensation. It's the only case of black reparations in US history. It was also used as a model to compensate Japanese Americans who were forcibly interred in camps during World War II. So your dad gathered all the information and obviously presented a very convincing case. Still, as you mentioned, the politics of the 1970s were the politics of the 1970s and many prejudices were deeply ingrained in our society. He talked about the $25,000 check what finally tipped the scales to the point where Congress and President Nixon took action to exonerate these soldiers? Well, well, actually, Congress and President Nixon did not exonerate the soldiers. President Nixon signed the order to compensate the lone survivor, Dorsey Willis, with, with $25,000 and $10,000 to the unremarried widows. Here is a fascinating piece to this amazing story. Acting Attorney General Richard Kleindies relieved Congress from having to actually pass the Hawkins bill, HR 68 to 66, which my father always thought Congress would pass with clear evidence of the soldier's innocence. However, dad later chastised himself for not recognizing that it would be next to impossible to reverse President Teddy Roosevelt, despite the merits. Klein just took what my father thought was a remarkable and intriguing position. He determined that the army had misconceived the purpose of the bill and recommended the Defense Department take action under existing law to set aside the dishonorable discharges. So it was the Defense Department who exonerated the soldiers. Thank you for, for clarifying that. You know, we've mentioned Dorsey Willis here a few times. Did your dad ever have a chance to meet him? Uh, yes, he did. Um, dad describes it as an extraordinary moment. Dad said, when I looked into his eyes, sadness looked back at me. When my father hands Mr. Willis his American flag from the US Army, Mr. Willis says, and I quote, I'm going to use this flag to put on my coffin. You're giving me back my flag. Dad also spoke at Mr. Willis's funeral and handed that same flag, which had been draped on his coffin to his wife. And your dad didn't stop with the men's exoneration, did he? Where do the National Archives come into the story? Dad always went to the National Archives to conduct more research on Brownville. As you pointed out early, he was really meticulous about his research. Um, also, the exoneration document was really important, and my father wanted to make sure if it was that it was recorded and placed into the National Archives without delay. Once there, it was a fact of history. Jenna, your father wrote of the way Teddy Roosevelt discharged those 167 Black soldiers, many who had served so bravely in combat. It followed almost all of them into old age. It drove them into insanity. And cruelly, it followed most of them to their deaths. Along the way, as they wandered across the country, they told their stories of their innocence to anyone who would listen. How much did their suffering haunt your father? My father was in close proximity to the soldier's suffering, and he too had suffered racial abuse. 
My dad grew up in the Great Depression, segregated as a black person, poor in the rural South. His father was run out of the state of Georgia by the Ku Klux Klan for defending himself from the police. Dad witnessed horrifying indignities. Dad looked into the sad eyes of the stranger who came to his door when he was a child, and he witnessed the stranger being dragged to his terrible death. Their suffering was his suffering, and he made it his life mission to seek justice for these soldiers. A reviewer wrote of your father, Mr. Baker's work did what the work of scarcely any historian ever does. It changed history. Your dad did his part, but is there more that could be done even today to right the injustices of those 167 men? Uh, yes, that to me is a next step. I mean, we know what happened to Dorsey Willis, but what about the other men and their families? It'd be interesting to document what happened to the other 167 soldiers after the gross injustice. I'd really like to hear their stories. I do know that one of the black soldiers, um, Robert Holloman, um, he was the son of John Holloman, who my dad writes about. He became the president of Mammoth Life Insurance Company in Louisville, Texas, um, which is my mom's old town. And I understand that his story is a story in and of itself. Now, on the other side of the coin, another review was titled, New Book Shows It's Never Too Late to Correct Injustice. Do you agree with that? It's never too late? Or can too much time pass to really correct an injustice? I learned from the late Congressman John Lewis that justice and equal rights are a marathon, not a sprint. Congressman Lewis started by advocating for equal rights in Selma, Alabama. He was beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge for having the audacity to advocate for equal rights for Black Americans. He saw the promise of the 1965 Voting Rights Act enacted only to see its protections rolled back by Shelby County versus Holder. That was the United States Supreme Court decision striking down Section 5, which required certain states and local governments to obtain federal preclearance before they implemented any new uh, laws and practices concerning voting. Many of the new restrictions that we see on voting rights today would not have been possible if that preclearance um, was still in effect. Um, Americans can reverse this by passing the Voting Rights Amendment Act. It will restore and strengthen parts of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. John Lewis did not see, he didn't live to see it pass, but he inspires us to persevere, to close the gap between justice and injustice. So in short, yes, I agree. It's never too late to do the right thing. We've been talking to Janet Baker. I'll be right back after a short break. All right, we're back with Janet Baker talking about her father's book, The Brownsville, Texas Incident of 1906, The True and Tragic Story of a Black Battalion's Wrongful Disgrace and Ultimate Redemption. The work her father, William Baker, did was so noteworthy that the New York Times wrote about his passing in 2018. That obituary noted that he was recognized at the White House ceremony where President Nixon signed legislation to compensate the last living soldiers and the widows of other soldiers, and that he was awarded the Army's Pace Award for Meritorious Service and its Legion of Merit. Jan, before the break, we were talking about the book and racial injustice and overturning uh, things if it's too long for things to pass before you can overturn them. The Roosevelt Center at Dickinson State University acknowledges that his dismissal of the innocent soldiers is usually considered his worst mistake as president. This is President Teddy Roosevelt we're talking about. Unfortunately, as the center's description of the incident also notes, Roosevelt faced criticism from many sectors, but never backed down, changed his mind, or apologized. He died 13 years later. Now, people as they get older often gain a new perspective on big issues in their lives and express regrets for their actions. Did your father... Or do you have any thoughts on why Teddy Roosevelt never changed his mind for such a huge mistake? Yeah, it, it was a big mistake. I mean, Jor Doris Kearns Goodwin indicated in her book, The Bully Pulpit, that Brownsville was a permanent stain on TR's legacy. And the author of Theodore Rex, um, Edwin Morris, indicated that TR knew the Black soldiers were not guilty. But in Dad's book, in the Seeds of Doubt chapter, um, it indicates that T.R. did have second thoughts about his decision, and that was reflected when he was talking to uh, one of his friends. Um, and so I encourage people to take a look at that chapter. Um, and it was really unfortunate that the white officers were acquitted, were acquitted using the same evidence T.R. denied to the Black soldiers. The way your father learned about the Brownsville incident, his fleeting but indelible connection with that old soldier who was killed the very next day, reminds us of what a small world we live in or that there truly is divine intervention in our lives. There's another connection that caught my eye. Your dad's father's first name was Roosevelt. 
Was that inspired by Teddy Roosevelt? And did your father ever talk about that? I am not sure about that, Chris, um, but I do know that FDR, Franklin Della Roosevelt, uh, his cousin was highly revered in the black community for his work to bring the safety net um, to millions of poor Americans via social security and with the Civilian Conservation Corps, which put tens of thousands of Americans to work during the Great Depression. So, uh, so maybe that's a factor, but I don't know for sure. This story also reminds me of how we can touch others' lives and never really know the influence we have. Your dad had passed away before the book was published, but a woman from San Jose, California, wrote in the comments of one book review that she had just found out through Ancestry.com that she was a descendant of one of the Brownsville Affair soldiers. She added, this is part of history and our children should be given the full picture. I'm thankful that I can share it with mine. I really wish I would have known about this while my elders were still here to tell their stories. Thank you, Mr. Baker, for writing this book and to your wonderful wife for ensuring the rest of the world would have access to it. How do you feel and what do you say after hearing those words? Uh, I feel really good and validated uh, by hearing those words. Um, and I want to hear how the gross injustice by the U.S. Army affected this woman and her family even further. Uh, we've heard about Mr. Willis, but we still haven't heard from the other soldiers. And so I hope this book provides evidence their families need to really write the next chapter you know, of their lives and really understand what happened to their, uh, to their loved ones. Yeah, that also made me wonder, I mean, do you ever hear from any of the other descendants, other soldiers? Is there such a disconnect, as that woman noted, that many of their descendants just don't know the story? Um, that's possible. I mean, I haven't personally heard from any of them, but I know my mother, who's from Louisville, Kentucky. She knew the descendants of Private John Holloman. Uh, he was a Black soldier who started a saloon in Brownsville to serve the Black soldiers. His son, Robert Holloman, who my dad writes about, became president of Monmouth Life Insurance Company in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I understand from my mom that this is a pretty important story. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about it from her. Well, let's talk about your, now, your mom here for a minute. We know she popped in during the break. Dr. Betty Foster Baker had a crucial role in the book's success. As she has said, she lived the story for 40 years too. Your father died in October, 2018, really just days after he finished this book that he'd worked on for 25 years. It would take another two years before it was published by Red Engine Press. And that was the result of the sheer determination of your mother. Please talk about her role in bringing the story of the Brownsville incident to a larger audience. Chris, we would not be having this conversation but for the tireless dedication of my mom to my father and his quest for justice. After eight years of trying to get this book published, she finally succeeded. She is a tireless freedom fighter. And I'm really grateful that for all that she's done to preserve the legacy and make people really and make people for sure that people know and and hear the undertold story of Brownsville. Like the lady you just mentioned who heard that she is descended from the Brownsville soldiers, this work is important and apparently it's making a difference in the lives of uh, many people. And so that's certainly gratifying. Your mom would like to see the book play on the movie screen too. Any success there yet? She's working with some interesting people. So we'll see how that plays out, Chris. I don't have any details right now on it. Well, I think maybe the more important question is who would she like to see play your dad and who would you like to see play your dad? Wow, I can think of a lot of people. I'm thinking Denzel Washington, um, Will Smith. Um, who was a man who played the man in Just Mercy? Uh, he was the, he's the civil rights crusader and Harvard lawyer, mm -hmm. Brian Stevens. That's it. Um, the, the man who played uh, Brian Stevens in the movie, Just Mercy, he is really an incredible actor. So, so love those three. Want to throw <laughs> Dwayne Johnson in there at all? Oh, that would be really interesting. <laughs> I really <laughs> like him. I've never seen him. This would be a different type of work for him, but of <laughs> course he's what he's definitely, I think he's the top actor in uh, Hollywood right now. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. So we've talked about how remarkable your dad's career was and his role in changing history. Your mother has led an extraordinary life too, besides what she's done to push the book forward and hopefully the big screen as well with Denzel or Will or, or whoever, The Rock. So she was a member of the first black Girl Scout troop in Louisville, Kentucky. First black girl to represent Kentucky at the Girl Scout National Encampment in Cody, Wyoming. First black president of the Kentucky State Girl Scout Conference in 1951. 
but it was a story about an essay that she wrote in 1958 that was especially moving to me. What was the title of that essay and what happened after she won third place in that contest? Mom's essay was called Why I Love America. And she wrote, America is like a mother to me to who I can plea for protection. She was written up in Time Magazine in a piece called Sweet Land of Liberty after the Brown Hotel in Louisville, Kentucky refused to serve her at the Lions Club luncheon where she was supposed to receive her prize for her essay. The Sealback Hotel in Louisville agreed to serve her so the luncheon could go forward. She was about 12 years old at the time this happened. So, you know, we've got about 15, 20 minutes left here in the show. We've talked about your father, the work he's done. We've talked about the mother, your mother and the importance she had in pushing this book forward. Let's take a moment here to talk about what they've done to make you who you are. Obviously very successful, as you said, recovering attorney. Uh, we won't hold against you that you went to another ACC school that's orange, um, but what led you into the, the field that you're into today? And do you see yourself having any involvement uh, in activities like this going forward? Well, one of the things I learned from my parents really is to just keep going uh, despite the despite the adversity. Um, and that really even motivates me today. I mean, we all face uh, challenges in our life and we just we just have to keep going. And I think it's a, I think it's important to continue to tell our own stories and to put and to keep pushing forward. I mean, my parents really valued education and my fa my family values education. And so that was something that was really instilled in me as a child uh, going forward. And I really think that that's part of the reason why I've been able to achieve what I've been able to do because I had the opportunity to uh, gain a good education. And regardless of what happens to you in life, nobody can really take that from you. And you can always use that as a foundation from which to spring. And so uh, that's really what I learned from my parents. And I wanna continue to, uh, tell the story um, and let people know what happened. And I hope that this story inspires them to make a difference um, in their lives and the lives of others. You know, and again, these are some couple of things we haven't talked about previously, but you know, your father being a black soldier, writing about a black incident that was decades old and given the politics of the time, do you think there was any, I'll say dismissing of his theory, just given the way race relations were at the time, you know, back in the seventies and, and, you know, and actually, unfortunately, even still today. Yeah. So in my father's case, uh, my dad reinvestigated the case, but I don't think people were dismissing the theory, um, his theory, uh, because, he, because the evidence, the evidence was already there, but it was ignored. And the reason why all those investigations were conducted, those were in connection with the court martials of the white soldiers. And so that's how we know what happened. And so there were thousands of pages of uh, reports and investigations and eyewitness testimonies and, uh, and uh, the Senate committee reports and so forth. And so my dad was able to review all that information and really highlight the, uh, the evidence and the facts that the, they already had that, excuse me, that were just ignored by the, uh, by the government um, with respect to the, to the black soldiers. Um, so I don't think that they dismissed his, um, they didn't dismiss his theory because uh, again, he reinvestigated something that had been done previously, but I think the resistance to what he was doing was because people didn't really want to overrule Teddy Roosevelt. I mean, when I think about Teddy Roosevelt, I see him on the back of that train, shaking his fist, speaking for hours to his constituents. You know, I think of the trust buster. I think of the man who, um, who created our national parks. I think about those old grainy photographs of him on safari in one of the African countries shooting up all those lions. And he really projected strength and people really loved him. And I think that the resistance was that they didn't want to go against a powerful, a powerful man, a powerful president, one who occupies such an important place in US history. But I think what my dad did was to really empathize with these soldiers. He was a soldier, as you pointed out, he was a soldier, these were soldiers. And he really was over, he was able to overcome the resistance um, to overturning this powerful president because he really appealed to the God within 
some of the people he worked with. Um, Colonel Wade Williamson, for example, he was the lawyer um, uh, from the Judge Advocate General, the JAG Corps, and he really didn't want to, he didn't want to reverse Teddy Roosevelt. And then when my dad presented him with the with the facts and the evidence, the incontrovertible facts and evidence, he's like, well, then he threatened his career. Um, but my dad was able to overcome this vice by appealing to his sense of justice and the God within and said, you know that these men have suffered an injustice. Um, and as a result of that, he changed his position. And so I think by really appealing to his sense of empathy and appealing to his sense of what's right, and looking at what happened to these men, losing your pension. Mingo Sanders, he was one of the oldest soldiers. He had fought alongside with Colonel Roosevelt at the time in Cuba and the Philippines. This man was two years away from earning his pension. He had been, he had been fighting heroically in, um, on behalf of the army in various places in the plains. He killed so many people. In, in pursuit of uh, the United States Army's goals at the time. And they took that all away from him for no reason at all. And he was considered by his commander to be the best person, one of the best soldiers in the military. And so I think just appealing to their sense of dignity really made a difference and was able, and so my dad was able to turn it around in that way. You know, in, in today's world, we've had a few guests on, um, Black veterans talking about some of the injustices they've seen at the military academies uh, during their career of service. Um, you know, you talk about your father going against uh, the power establishment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what sort of character does somebody have to have to really go against that decades or even centuries old, you know, establishment to have their voice heard and to reopen something that was closed that the government had investigated and had, you know, and quote unquote proven their case. You know, what do you think is was, you know, that fighting, burning fire within your father to get this out there? I believe that the burning fire within my father was empathy, the, the combination of his empathy and the combination of these soldiers who, despite all the horrible things that happened to him, they, the stranger of the door, he told his story. He, uh, as I pointed out earlier, the soldiers, um, they, they, they scattered throughout the country and they still continue to tell their story. Mr. Willis, um, who, was shine, who was relegated to shining shoes in a bank, he told the man who owned that bank, Mr. J.C. Cornelius, what had happened. And he told his story. And then that story eventually trickled down to my father. And because of my father's own experience, uh, being a black person in the South, having his father run out of the state of Georgia by the Ku Klux Klan and all the other indignities that he suffered, he really empathized with uh, these soldiers. And I think that when you have somebody who is empathetic, that really gives people the strength and tenacity to really lead, to make a difference. Um, a person says, I mean, when you can really connect with somebody in an emotional way um, and you're determined to make a positive difference, this is kind of the strength and tenacity, which um, gives people the backbone to, to really overcome and achieve their goals and objectives. And so I think that's what happened to my father. I mean, he was just very empathetic to these men and he saw how they'd, you know, how they'd served heroically and honorably um, and then they were mistreated. And so he just had a really strong sense of justice. Well, and to that point, it's certainly a great um, accomplishment and certainly a great attribute to him for really fighting for this, for, you know, believing in it, for pushing it. And so um, hopefully that changes things for future generations as well. So uh, thanks to you and your family for that. You know, you and I got connected by a colleague of ours, and you've given many talks about your father's book, you know, several times over. Is there anything new you've learned about the book or your father as you give the talks each time? Well, I didn't know uh, that my dad was receiving death threats. Like I knew that he was, uh, I knew that his career was threatened. And that's not unusual when you kind of go against the grain of what your organization may want to, is, is doing. But I didn't know that he was receiving death threats. That was, that was new information to me. I guess my parents kind of hid that from me and my brother and wanted to protect us from that. But that just makes me realize, you know, how important this was to him that he would just uh, really lead through adversity and um, do everything he could to, to, to make a difference. So that's one of the new things um, that I've learned in this case. 
And I've also learned about uh, Robert Holloman, um, the gentleman I spoke about earlier. Um, I thought it was so interesting because John Holloman, the one who established the Allison Saloon for the Black soldiers, because uh, basically the Black soldiers were mistreated when they tried to go into the other saloons. Um, this man, he was so dedicated to his family. I mean, his, uh, I guess he had a, uh, his marriage was falling apart and his wife was in some other part of town. I mean, another, another state actually. And so he was determined to bring his son to Brownsville and he was gonna bring his housekeeper over to um, raise the son. And so anyway, he was always, he was very enterprising and he was a money lender, he extended credit and he engaged in all sorts of uh, uh, business ventures. And so I thought it was really interesting um, that his son became the president of his own life insurance company. So I guess that trickled down to the, to, to the family. So that, that was certainly interesting to see as well. Well, you mentioned leading through adversities, which your, your father and your mother didn't. So that's the a key point of what the show is focused on. And so you know, that's why we wanted to highlight this today. You talked about them, I'll say shielding, or I think you said the word protecting things from you and your brother. Um, you know, the world was different. Well, a bit different in the 1970s, as we know, in the 80s, but unfortunately not as different as they should be in, in today's world, given you know, the, the race relation tensions we have with African-Americans, Asian-Americans, and Pacific Islanders. You, from what you've learned from your parents and what they've gone through, and obviously they protected you from a lot, you know, you know about the death threats, and that's a, a big thing to hide from a, from a child, obviously. You know, what are some of those learning life lessons, I guess, for lack of a better word, that you can take away from that to instill upon the next generation so we don't go through these horrific incidents again? Well, I would go back to really, I talk about again, um, the empathy. Um, a lot of times people don't have empathy because they don't know what other people are going through. I mean, I hear that all the time. I mean, you know, we look at other people and we're, and we, we sometimes we tend to marginalize uh, certain individuals and say, oh, they're not really people or they're less than. And actually, that was one of the that was actually one of the big legacies of slavery, um, despite all of the all the horrible things that we know about about slavery. Uh, one of the things that's less talked about is really the how it affected people's minds and, and made people believe that there really are differences amongst people based upon their race, based upon their religion and so forth but the but the anthropologists say actually we're all we're all the same and the way somebody appears is really based upon where they live and life actually started in africa so in a sense we're all african <laughs> now we may look different now because you know we went to norway or we went to japan or wherever and so you know our bodies have adapted based upon our environment but you know at the end of the day we're, we're all the same but unfortunately because of slavery and other other terrible things in history Oftentimes, uh, we don't see each other. We don't see each other that way. And so, it's uh, what I've observed is that it's important to really walk in somebody else's shoes, whether you're trying to uh, promote justice, like my parents tried to do, or you're trying to lead your team at your company uh, to success. If uh, you know to to understand a person, to understand what makes them tick, what makes them motivated, what is disempowering, what is empowering, if you can really empathize with that person and understand their point of view, you can really um, lead that person to success, you can launch that person, you can launch your team, um, and you're going to have a better team. And so it's really important to really just to be um, able to understand the point of view of other people. And how do we do that, Chris? We do that through listening. We do that through listening to other people's stories. Like when I think of this story right here with Brownsville, as I mentioned before, Mr. Willis was telling his story. And guess what? Mr. Mr. Cornelius, the wealthy banker, he listened to that story. Even though he was a, he owned the bank, he was a wealthy man. And there was this poor black man that shined his shoes for 30 years. He empathized with that man and he listened to his story. And if it weren't for Mr. J.C. Cornelius from Minnesota, we wouldn't know anything about Dorsey Willis. And the same thing is true um, with my father. Had, had some, some of these soldiers not told my grandfather, uh, my great grandfather, the story, my father wouldn't know this story. And so stories are really important. And so from my point of view, it's important to listen to people's stories, listening to their suffering. Don't marginalize people because they're not part of like the in group or the important group or they're considered less than because of, you know, the, uh, 
the cancer that infects our society. So I think that uh, that's that's the that's the road to success from my view to really empathize with those around us and understand them and take that knowledge and make a difference in the world, whether it's on your business team, whether you're trying to, you know, pass a bill in Congress or, you know, whatever you're trying to do. I think empath empathic leadership is uh, what's really important today. Janet Baker has been our guest today. Her father's book, The Brownsville, Texas Incident of 1906, The True and Tragic Story of a Black Battalion's Wrongful Disgrace and Ultimate Redemption is available through amazon.com, Barnes and Noble, and other booksellers. Janet, thanks so much for being us today. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Chris, for having me on your show. It's been a great pleasure. And I'm oh. so happy to hear that you went to Syracuse too. Go Orange. <laughs> Go and Orange. as always, thank you to our wonderful audience for tuning in to Next Steps Forward. I'm Chris Meek. For more details about upcoming shows and guests, please follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Chris Meek Public Figure. We'll be back next Tuesday, same time, same place, with another leader from the world of business, politics, sports, or entertainment. Until then, stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward.